Welcome to week two of Christian Evidences, our look into the world of apologetics. What I'd like to do in the first part of today's lecture is discuss various theistic arguments for God in the ancient world. The question I want to ask is, is atheism new? And what I want to suggest is that in many ways, the atheism that we've seen in the past 200 years or so that has appeared in the Western world is an anomaly that the notion of what we consider to be atheism is foreign to the ancient mind. In fact, I'd say it this way, the very word atheism or atheist is a modern construct, a way to describe something that before the Enlightenment was such an oddity that most people would not have even thought in those terms. So let's talk about a history of theistic arguments. And of course by theistic arguments we mean arguments for the existence of God or uh, particularly in the ancient world for the one true God versus competing gods. So my first point is this, the need for theistic arguments is relatively new. And what I mean by relatively new is there have always been some form of arguments for God, but the tried and true arguing against atheism model is very new. In the ancient world, there was little need for it because, as I said a moment ago, there were no, or almost no, true atheists. So when we talk about uh, the Bible, and particularly the Old Testament, were interested in what scholars call the ancient Near East, as opposed to the Far East, and we think of Far East, we think of China and Vietnam and those countries. Well, the ancient Near East, or what might be called um, the modern Middle East, although those wouldn't be exactly comparable, um, represents a culture that in many ways was similar to that of Israel that we read about in the Old Testament. Of course, it wasn't exactly the same because Israel was unique among the nations. But many of the uh, folkways, many of the customs, um, many of the laws that Israel had were also reflected in other ancient Near Eastern cultures. So when uh, Bible scholars want to know what the world was like, for instance, in the time of Moses, they won't just look in the Bible. The Bible certainly gives important details, but they'll look at uh, other cultures that surrounded the people of Israel at the time. And so the ancient Near East, trying to understand their customs, trying to understand the world the way it was back then. And the case is that there were practically no true atheists in the ancient Near East. What you do see, and you don't see a lot of this, but you do see in the Old Testament are what you might call conversions to the God of Israel. Now, this is an important point, and don't miss it. Israel was not supposed to be evangelistic in the way that Christians are. Israel was not told, go out and tell everybody about your God and why you need to convert to him. That wasn't the plan. The plan, as laid out in Genesis 12, was that through one man, Abram, or later Abraham, God would bless all nations. What he promised Abram in Genesis 12 was, that he'd make him into a great nation, and that all those who blessed that nation would be blessed, and all those who cursed that nation would be cursed. So, um, in the mind of the Israelites, the way they were to bless the rest of the world was that they would be a holy nation, and that the rest of the world would look to them for blessing. And if someone dared resist them and their God, then that, that person or that country would be cursed. So, they did not view themselves as being evangelistic agents. In fact, it was quite the other way around. God himself was his own evangelist, so that when Israel entered the Promised Land, for instance, you had people like Rahab, who had already heard about the uh, incredible things that God was doing. and She was frightened. She said everyone in um, Jericho was frightened because of what they'd heard God had been doing for them. So in that sense, God was his own evangelist. So my point is this. Israel did not go out seeking to convert people, and that really wasn't um, their job. But still you see these conversions 
or what, what I'll call conversions, um, to the God of Israel in the Old Testament. The first example I have is uh, the one I mentioned just a moment ago, Rahab, who of course was a prostitute of Jericho. And here she was, a Canaanite woman, a Jerichoite, who only knew um, certain details about the God of Israel. But what she knew had convinced her that he was the true God. So notice what it says, um, and this is a representation of the scarlet cord, or the red, um, uh, the red cord that she put out her window so that her family would be spared. So it says in Joshua 2, 8 through 13, and I realize that's going to cut off just a little bit uh, at the bottom of your screen, but I'll, I'll read it to you. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land. Now notice that word Lord is in all caps. And anytime you see that in the Old Testament, L-O-R-D in all caps, that means that it's referring not to just any generic Lord. The word for a generic Lord is Adonai in Hebrew. But here, the Hebrew word is being reflected in these uh, four capital letters is the name for the God of Israel, the unique name. I don't, I'm not in the habit of saying it, but I'll say it this one time. Of course, we don't know exactly how it's pronounced, but Yahweh is a good approximation. Jehovah in some translations. So she's saying, I know that your God has given you this land. Um, Notice what she says in verse 11. When we heard of what God had done, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God, notice, is heaven is God in heaven above and on earth below. So she came to believe that the one God of Israel is God in heaven above and on earth below, as opposed to whatever local deity that she had worshipped uh, early in her life. So she was spared and she became a part of Israel. So in that sense, she was converted to the God of Israel. Of course, you've got the story of Naaman the Syrian, who, when he consulted his Hebrew servant um, for some way to cure his leprosy, and she said, you need to go see the prophet. Of course, Naaman was offended when that prophet told him that uh, you need to go dip in the Jordan seven times. It says in 1 Kings 5, after Naaman had been healed, when he returned to the man of God with all his company and came and stood before him, he said, Behold now, I know there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Um, so you see here that Naaman came to believe in that one God of Israel. I'm going to move on without exasperating that point. You also have the very well-known story of Ruth, the Moabitess, or the Lady of Moab, who, of course, had worshipped her own gods. But when her husband died, she attached herself to her mother-in-law. And this famous passage that you read about, that's often read in weddings, actually applies to the love of uh, daughter-in-law for her mother-in-law. Of course, it can be applied other ways. But she says... Ruth says in verse 16, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you, for where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. And just so you know that she realizes who that God is, verse 17, where you die, I die, there I'll be buried. Thus may the Lord, and see that all caps again, the Lord, the God of Israel, do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. So she attached herself to Naomi and thus attached herself to Israel. And by the way, Ruth is in the lineage of Jesus. So not only did she convert, but she became a part of the um, line of the Savior of Israel and the Savior of the world. You know the story of Jonah? And when the great storm came, the sailors, of course, were afraid they were going to lose their own lives. And in a sense, they converted um, because they were afraid that Jonah's God, 
would punish them for throwing him into the sea, even though Jonah told them to do that. So verse 14 says in uh, Jonah 1, Then they called on the Lord, notice there's that word again, all caps, that means the God of Israel, the one God, Jehovah God. They called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Yahweh, do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us, for you, Yahweh, have done as you have pleased. So you see here, they began to pray to Jonah's God. And of course, you've got the story of the people of Nineveh when Jonah actually went uh, and preached. An interesting side note, his sermon was not repent. If you go back and read it, actually his sermon was very short and it was this. In 40 days... This city will be destroyed by God. Something like 40 days. Now I can't remember the exact uh, number of days because I haven't consulted it lately. But all he said was, look, judgment is coming and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> but of course the king and the people repented. And so um, it says that the king issued a proclamation in verse 7. In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do let... No, not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing, so they were fasting. Do not let them eat or drink water, but both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth, a sign of repentance. And let men call on God earnestly, that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows, God may turn and relent, by the word, that word is also translated repent in other places, and withdraw his burning anger, so that we will not perish. And so you have the people of Nineveh, including their king, Repenting and God sparing them. Now a natural question you might have would be about Psalm 14.1 that says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, their deeds are vile, there is no one who does good. And so you say, Michael, there's an example of atheism being mentioned in uh, Psalms. And what I'd say here is, I don't think that's actually what's happening. Certainly, you have what you might call practical atheism. Now remember, in the Old Testament, to be a fool is more than just being an idiot. Someone who doesn't know things. Not just being stupid. A fool is someone who is corrupt. Morally, spiritually, ethically. So the, the last thing you want to be is a fool. That's why even in the New Testament, Jesus says, if you call your brother a fool, you are uh, in danger of the fire of hell. Not because that word by itself necessarily means that. I mean, if, if that's the case, then Mr. T is in bad trouble because he pities the fool. and He calls everybody fool. No, in uh, Old Testament um, Jewish terms, to say someone was fool was to say they were morally reprobate. And so what the psalmist is saying here is a person who lives like that has said in his heart there is no God. His life shows it. Now, he wouldn't come out and say that, but he lives as if it's that way. And we know that in his heart, he's acting as if there is no God. Okay, so that's, that's a practical atheism, although you don't see anyone arguing for it at the time. They're much more likely to argue for their own local gods. When you get to the times of the Greco-Roman world, so especially in what we often call that intertestamental period, you will see that there were some atheists who cropped up. So what I want to do in the uh, second video is talk about some atheists in the Greco-Roman world and then talk about atheism in the modern world.